Hey friends, I'm Justin Roth and welcome to my channel and to this tutorial on the acoustic guitar version of Jacob Collier and Lizzie McAlpine's song, Never Gonna Be Alone. Today you're gonna learn how to play this song with only four basic chord shapes that are as easy to play as a power chord. And it's the same way that Jacob plays it in an altered tuning. There's no finger gymnastics, no difficult jazz voicings, and there's even a chord that you can play with one finger. Not that finger, Johnny. This lesson is based on three different acoustic versions of this song. The Live at the Troubadour show where Jacob, Lizzie, and John Mayer played it live for the first time ever. The BBC front row audio recording interview. And most importantly, the Blogatech takeaway show. Because in that video, we can hear and see everything that he's doing on acoustic guitar. Because the album version on Jesse Volume 4 doesn't even feature the acoustic guitar at all. All of these versions are in a playlist that are linked in the description below. We're going to break down this song into three main sections. The verse and chorus we're going to do together because it's the same chord progression throughout both sections. Next we'll look at the bridge, which features two new chords. Then we're going to take a close look at the modulation itself. And now each of those chapters will have two parts. First, I'll demonstrate a brief playthrough of the section with view of my hands so you can see and hear everything in context. Second, I'll explain the chords themselves, their fingering, and how they are related to one another so you can gain an understanding of how the chords are built in this altered tuning. I'll have chord diagrams on screen up here, and we'll also take a look at the general strumming pattern and other chord voicing inversion options. My goal in this lesson is to be really comprehensive, but to give you the option to repeat or skip sections as needed. And the great news is if you've watched any of my tutorials on Jacob's other songs, you already know all of the chord shapes that you need to know to play this song. Stick around to the end to see how we're gonna actually add something to this arrangement that Jacob doesn't even usually have to play. And we'll take a glimpse at the backstory of how this song came to be in the first place. So grab your guitar, let's dig in. Now there are so many layers on Jacob's productions that it can be super overwhelming and seemingly inaccessible to find a way to understand, let alone reproduce or play one of these songs. But guess what? On each of these acoustic versions, he gives us the keys to the castle. Let me explain. Without all the layers of production, the acoustic versions of his songs are bare bones, but harmonically, it's all still there for us to wrap our heads and hands around. Just plain triads, simple chord shapes. If this is your first time on my channel and haven't seen my other videos on Jacob's songs before, check out this tutorial playlist here. It features Little Blue, Witness Me, summer rain, and more to come. And if you want more of these Jacob tutorials and transcriptions, which accompany all of these tutorials, please like and subscribe, click that bell notification so that you can stay posted on every new video that I make for one of Jacob's songs. I've got a bunch more in line. I am dedicated to keep bringing you more and more of these tutorials on his acoustic guitar versions, as long as he keeps making them for us. And if you haven't learned one of Jacob's songs before, this song is a great place to start. Why? Well, there's only four main chord shapes that we're gonna use, all built on the lowest three strings. And get this, learning only two of them, the major and minor invert position, you'll be able to play 90% of the song. Also, this song is in 4-4, there's no compound meter, there's nothing complicated, rhythmically speaking. Now, the trickiest part of this song to play as a soloist is the modulation, but it's not a musical challenge, it's a mechanical one. It involves moving the capo in the middle of the song. So we're gonna take a look at a few different ways to accomplish this, and we'll unpack that later. Lastly, this song is really repetitive in terms of the chord progression, and it's a strummer. There's no finger picking technique that you need. Even Jacob says that this song is a rare one for him because it doesn't move a lot. There's not a lot of extra chords. We all know Jacob can move and pivot and modulate all over the place and make our head spin in the best way. What was that? So it's a really great place to start. One caveat to prepare you, I'm gonna be mentioning terms like inversions, chord extensions, modulation, and to some of you, this will be familiar language. However, if it's not, don't worry. You can just focus on the chord shapes and you don't have to know what those things are, but someday you'll want to. So listen in to glean what you can. It'll only help you in the future. I've already released a full licensed transcription of this song that I'm basing this entire lesson on, complete with study notes and tips, and it's available digitally or as a download PDF 
from reputable sheet music suppliers. It looks like this, and you can find the link to my transcription store down in the description. All right, let's take a look at the tuning. Now, if you don't know this already, Jacob has a custom five string guitar. The rest of us, we have six. So we have to make a little uh, accommodation here. Now, Jacob's favorite tuning that he has posted about before and the tuning that uh, many of these other acoustic versions are in, from low to high, D, A, E, A, D, on five strings. This song on his five string is D, A, E, A, E. So the high, the first string, is an E instead of a D. It is only one string different. However, the way that we have to adjust it on six string, and depends on the song, sometimes it varies, and we, sometimes we have a few different options. Because we have that third string that he does not have, our third or what would normally be a G string, I'm proposing that our tuning instead is D, A, E, F sharp, A, E. Then this song has a capo on the third fret. So why is this tuning different from the other ones? Well, in other songs that I've covered so far where Jacob is in D-A-E-G-A-D, he typically uses the D shape as the home or the tonic, no matter where the capo is. The top two strings, or the pedal notes, would be considered A and D relative to this without the capo. That would be the root and the fifth of the tonic chord. These two notes also color all the other chords in the key of D nicely and keep pulling us back to the tonic of D. But now with our E on top and the F sharp on the third string is played using this F sharp minor shape B in our home. Our new open strings are F sharp, which is the same as our root. A is our third. And then we have an E, which is a flat seven or minor seven on top. And there are also chord tones that work nicely over the other chords used in the song. Now I've got an entire tuning video that you can find up here that is gonna show you how to get to these different tunings of Jacobs and explaining some of the basic chord shapes and reasons behind choosing one tuning over another. Feel free to dig into that if you need a little more guidance on retuning the guitar. But basically what we're gonna to do to get to that tuning like this shows over here is we're gonna lower our E string or our sixth string down a whole step to D. Our fifth string, our A, will stay the same. Our fourth string, our D, will go up a whole step to E. Our G string, or our third string, will go down a half step to F sharp. Our second string, B, will go down a whole step to A. And our first string, E, will stay the same. Okay, so let's take a quick look at how we're gonna name the chords, because they're all gonna look different because we're not in standard tuning. However, as is common when playing guitar with a capo, we're gonna call them by their shape and what they would be called without the capo. For example, if I said, that's a D chord because our lowest note is D, we're still gonna call that shape a D shape as we move it up with the capo on the third fret. It's the D shape. The pitch is F because we're up three half steps, but for the sake of learning the patterns and the shapes, we're gonna call it D. Now this is the format I've used on all my Jacob tutorials and the transcriptions. And because nobody puts a capo on the third fret and plays a D and calls it F, unless you have to communicate it to some other player. Our bass player and our piano player are saying, that's not a G, C, and D, come on. Well, maybe people with perfect pitch do, but that's not me. And since patterns and repeatable shapes are a luxury of guitar, we're gonna use and abuse them. This also gives us the ability to move the capo to wherever it works on the neck for your or your singer's vocal range. And you can still just call it by its shape no matter what key you're in. Now in terms of the shapes that we're calling it, we're gonna say this song is in F sharp minor, because if that's D, E, F, and we'll take a look at all these chords in a minute. Now, most of us choose our capo position to suit our vocal range, the lowest and highest note that we have to hit. Jacob has a huge range and he probably feels the resonance of any particular key itself. And maybe chooses to put a song in that based on that. But that's just not a fair way for the rest of us to go about choosing our capo position that works for us, is it? Now I've mentioned if you've watched my other tutorials, there are no new chord shapes. There's just a couple variations on them. But even though the first and third strings are tuned differently from the other shapes that I've taught in the other tutorials, 
The reason there's no new chord shapes is our lowest three strings, D, A, and E, are the same, and that is where all the chord shapes are built. The upper three strings just give us the chord extensions and droning strings, or pedal notes as Jacob likes to call them. All right, let's get to the song. I'll have additional notes over here as needed, as well as chord diagrams over here for you to follow along. So the verse and chorus, it's the same progression. It's three chords, but only two shapes that we use. I'm gonna go further in depth in the next section to explain these, but it's basically the major chord in root position, which we're gonna call D, major chord in root position, which we're gonna call E, a whole step up, and then a minor chord in root position, which we're gonna call F sharp minor. All right, here's a quick playthrough of the intro, skipping ahead to the second verse and into the chorus. that looks up at the moon In the garden where I held you for a moment In the gloom There's something so sweet about it Holding on to this moment Cause it made me fall for you Ooh, Made me fall for you Take me back to the window Take me back to the door You'll be right where I left you I'm never gonna be alone. So let's take a closer look at what each of those chords are. So what we're calling our D shape. I'm gonna explain it based on what frets we're actually playing. The D major shape in root position. Root position means the root of our chord is the lowest note that we're playing. In this case, we have our root, our fifth, and our major third on that fourth string. So in an alter tuning like this, we get to repeat our shapes. We don't have to learn a new chord shape to play the next major in root position shape. Our E chord is simply a whole step up. So we're gonna take the same basic shape and just shift it up two frets. So we're gonna bar with our index finger. We've got two, two, four. Root, fifth, and our major third. Now when we go to the next shape, the minor in root position shape, if we take a major chord and want to make it minor, we have to flat the third. So this is where it's good to remember that when we're in root position, our third is on that fourth string. So when we move our chord shape up to that F minor shape, because we have D, E, F sharp, we've got root, fifth, and a minor shape on the fifth fret. So it's four, four, five. Our first shape is the major in root position, major in root position, and then minor in root position. Now because these acoustic versions are all live, they are not all identical, and that gives us a lot of freedom in how we play this. In general, there's a couple things that Jacob does often, but it doesn't mean that it has to happen every time. So the first most signature thing is the hammer-on. Hammer-on on the second fret of the fourth string while we're on this D major shape. Now when we look at the strumming, he uses these droning strings, or pedal notes as he calls them, over the top of chords, but we're not strumming them all the time. He uses them as accents. I like to think of the droning strings or pedal notes as almost like a drummer would think of cymbals. They are accents. Yes, they're extensions to the chords, but they are used rhythmically to create this contrasting kind of splash of high notes over the lower chords. So if we count out the whole rhythm of the basic strumming pattern, knowing that sometimes there's variations, notice where those accents fall. One and a two. Let's loop that for a second. Now, 
Now, for the sake of contrast, you really notice that in the intro. In the verses, we might be a little bit more muted with those accents on the high strings, just to create a little contrast, leave a little space for the vocal. And again, these are live versions that we're basing it off of, so they all vary based on the mood, the intimacy of the show, all these things, but that is the general rhythmic feel of the progression. Now, in the acoustic versions, you'll also hear him add a melodic lick sometimes. We'll take a look at that, but he started to play this on his electric Strandberg guitar live. Some of those videos have been starting to come out. So he's starting to do more and more of these licks, but basically where he's doing them, let's take a quick look. The most common one is sliding between the second and fourth fret of our second string or our A string. Other places that we can find the notes that we can use for fills, as a repeatable pattern that we can remember as guitar players. In the second and fourth fret of those first two strings, second and third fret of that third string, and then second and fourth fret of basically all the other strings. So although we only have those three chord shapes, the D, the E, and the F sharp minor, in the verse and chorus. He does do a couple variations just before the instrumental on some of the versions. This is again some freedom that we have. If it's enough for you with just those three chords, you can continue to do that. But Jacob loves to use inversions, especially in this tuning. It really works super well. So let's take a look at what those shapes are. They are the way that he does it, but they are optional to you because they don't change what the chord is, they just change the inversion of it, which means instead of having the root of our chord in the bass, we might change to have the third or the fifth in the bass. If you want to learn more about chord inversions in these tunings that Jacob uses, you can watch my chord voicing tutorial here that breaks down all the shapes that Jacob uses in these tunings. So let's take a look at when Jacob uses these inversions. And again, it varies from version to version, but you've got some freedom here. The first time we hear it is in the latter part of the first chorus, when he says, sitting on the floor. So it goes like this. Take me back to the window, take me back to the door. You'll be right where I left you, sitting on the floor. I'm never gonna be alone. And then it goes into the instrumental section. Let's take a closer look at those chords. The first two of those, just like we had the same shape of the major in root position, they were the same related shape. These first two chords in the inversions are gonna be related as well. They start up on the seventh fret, meaning the seventh fret above the capo, because this is our new zero or our nut. And it's gonna go seven, nine, 10. This is second version, which means it's got the fifth of the chord in the bass instead of the root. So we've got our fifth, our third, and our root. Now this is our D over A, D slash A, meaning it's a D chord like this, but instead we've got the A in the bass. Our next chord is an E over B, or E slash B. It's our E major chord, but with our fifth in the bass, or the B. So what used to be E major in root position is up here on the ninth fret above the capo, 9, 11, 12. We have our fifth, our third, and our root, or our E. So those are the same shapes. Now our last chord is a major chord in first inversion. It is not the inversion of what our third chord was down here, F sharp minor. It's actually an A chord, or what would be an A chord without the capo. And it would be 11, 12, 12. So this is an A slash C sharp, or A over C sharp. Let's hear them together real quick. Now in terms of what fingers we use, I've noticed on most of Jacob's videos, he tends to use his index, middle, and ring finger most of the time to make all these chords on the bottom three strings. And like on Little Blue, sometimes he'll use his pinky on the high strings, but it's not common that he plays up on those strings. And so I'm proposing that you use instead, we're gonna to try to use all four of our fingers 
choosing one or the other based on which is more comfortable. However, I'm suggesting that you almost always keep your pinky on that fourth string. It's gonna make for better economy of motion, kind of better ergonomics in terms of getting from one chord shape to the next. So you have less times that you have to switch your fingering. So if you look at where the pinky is used on each of these chord shapes, on that fourth string, the pinky always gets to stay on that string. Now, if I didn't use my pinky and I changed up the fingering, I might say, okay, there's my index finger. There's my third finger. There's my second finger. Here, I've got to use my pinky. Or here, if I didn't use my pinky, this stretch feels really unnatural and makes my hand want to cramp up. So do what is comfortable for you, but long term, I think there's better ergonomics in the in the left hand by using that pinky on the fourth string. Then after that chorus, it goes into the instrumental, which is the same progression as we have done this entire song so far. Now the length of the instrumental section is different on the BBC front row. It's intimate, so they keep it short and sweet. On the Blogatech version and on the, the version with John Mayer at Live at the Troubadour, it's longer so that they have more uh, opportunity to stretch out with the solo. And Jacob will vary that progression from the more the lower position chords to the inverted chords, as is appropriate for the mood and energy of that solo. So you've got some freedom to choose there. Okay, I've got a couple other things I want to show you that are options that you can add. Because this tutorial and transcription is based off of multiple live versions, I have also seen the live video of Jacob playing it on his electric Strandberg five string at the Prism in London, as well as on a Zoom call as part of his Patreon. And of course, Jacob being Jacob, he's doing some things slightly different or adding in a couple new things here and there. So I'm going to show you the things that I have seen him do so far and you can choose if you want to add them in yourself. So one of the chord shapes or variations that he adds, most notably where I hear it is on the BBC front row version in that instrumental section, is he adds an additional major chord in root position, a slide up from the F sharp minor shape up to the A shape. It sounds like this. Same as usual, and here it comes. So at the end of the instrumental, he does those first two major chords in second inversion, starting on the seventh fret, seven, nine, 10. He's doing downstrokes on eighth notes, and between the first and second chord, he slides up to the next chord on the and of four, sounding like this. One and two and three and four and. And the next one, he slides up on the and of two. One and two and three and four and. Now the next chord he plays to set up the bridge, it's gonna be a minor chord shape in root position, which is the same shape we used down here on the fourth fret for that F sharp minor shape. But now it's gonna be up here on the ninth fret. Ninth fret above the capo, it's gonna look like your 12th fret. But... So we've got nine, nine, 10. Now it's gonna feel a little kind of congested here if you're using your pinky on that fourth string like I recommended. But we're gonna have an example here that's gonna show you why I suggest doing this. Now it's congested, but these fingers aren't really in the way. They're actually on top providing a little bit of strength to holding this chord down. So if we call that our B minor shape relative to the capo, our next one is gonna be another shape that we've already done, that A over C sharp or that major chord in first inversion, starting on the 11th fret above the capo. So it'll be 11, 12, 12. And now here I'm using my index, ring, and pinky. Now we could just do those two chords and it is what he appears to do on the earlier acoustic versions, is these two chords. But hold on, I'm gonna show you one third chord after we take a listen to what this would sound like. And I know. But now let's take a look at the new added chord that he has started to play when he's playing this solo by himself. And he switches to this chord just for the last two beats before the start of the bridge. All we have to do is raise 
the note that we're playing on the fifth string by a half step. So if we go from 11, 12, 12, then we go 11, 13, 12. So that fifth string just goes up a half step. So it is a finger change. And it sounds like this. These variations are all included on the transcription that you can find the link for in the description below. I kind of consolidated the what I thought to be the best facets or best little variations of each version into that transcription so that you've got choices. All right, let's take a look at the bridge. Now I said there's two new chords, meaning there's two new chords that are kind of outside of the key that we're in. However, they are all related to the shapes that we have already learned. Remember, Jacob is on a five string guitar. We are on six, so we're gonna have subtle voicing differences. However, I've found substitutes that are gonna work really well without changing the function or tension or extensions of the chords that still really work well. So first I'll do a demonstration playthrough of this short little bridge, and then we'll break it down. And I know so much I want to say to you Even though I know nothing's going to change All right, it's short and sweet, and I know that you know that modulation's coming up next, but we're going to break that down in the next section. Now, the first chord of the bridge, it is a shape we've already used, just starting on a different fret. It's the major chord in root position, which we had used calling it D, in E. Now, this is going to be starting on the third fret. Now, Jacob plays this shape the same way that he does the other major chord and root position shapes used in other places. But he also bars this entire chord on the third fret because where we used these shapes before, those top two droning open strings work over those chords. Since this new chord is kind of a modulation, sort of, or it's a chromatic chord outside of the key we're in, those top two droning strings don't work over that chord. So our way around it is we bar the whole thing. Now, as I said, Jacob plays this same shape. So we can do that. We can also simplify it. Because if we think of just what the notes are of this chord, it's the root, the fifth, the third. Now, Jacob not having that third string, the next note on the second string would be the fifth, and the top one would be the ninth. So we could call that an F9 shape. Without the capo, I know everything is up another minor third, but we're calling it by the shape. So because it only has a root, fifth, third, and a ninth in it, we can bar this with one finger. Why? Because if we break down what the notes are, we have the root, the fifth. Now we have a ninth there, which is an octave below the ninth that we have on the top string. There we have our third, which Jacob used to have to fret because he doesn't have that third string to get the third. He has to fret the third. But we've already got it in the tuning. Then we have our fifth and our ninth again. So the notes are identical. We just have a lower octave of the nine. Now the next chord is a shape we've already used, but in a different location. We called it a major chord in first inversion. Before it was A over C sharp up here. Now we're gonna do that same basic shape down here on the second fret, just on the lowest three strings, frets two, three, and three. Now we would call this C over E, meaning it's a C chord with the E or the third of the chord in the bass. But because we've kind of modulated on these two chords, those top two droning strings don't work over this. So since we barred this first one, we can continue that, that bar. We just have to switch our fingers. I suggest using your index finger on the second fret of the sixth string and then barring your ring finger across the third fret of all the other strings, if you can. And you can stack your middle finger on top of it for extra strength. And the last chord, 
is a chord that we learned at the very beginning. It's just that D shape again. Zero, zero, two, using the open strings. So let's put it all together. Now to get back into that cycle, he's done it a couple different ways. Sometimes he does, he follows it with the E and the F sharp minor that he does in the original progression of the verse and chorus. You can do that, or he's also done it where he's doing the a major chord in second inversion starting on the second fret, which we use this shape up here on the seventh fret and on the ninth fret. But now if we use that same shape, two, four, five on the second fret, another version he hangs on this in place of going E to F sharp minor. So I'm gonna cycle that first line of the bridge so you can hear both possible ways to end it. The first one will end it in going D to E to F sharp minor. The second one will go from D to the A over E. And I know so much I wanna say to you. And I know so much I want to say to you, even though... So, subtle difference, and Jacob has done it both ways. Okay, so I'm really excited about this part, the modulation. Now, most of the time, Jacob, for a modulation, might have multiple new chords. This modulation has less to do with harmonic complexity, it has a mechanical complexity to it that requires us to move the capo. Now in all three of the acoustic versions that we referenced, Jacob doesn't even have to play the chords that lead up to the modulation. What he has to do is move his capo a half step. On the Blogatec version, Emily is playing the chords for the modulation. On Live at the Troubadour, Lizzie is playing the chords for the modulation, and Jacob simply stops playing to move his capo from the third fret to the fourth fret. Now, if you're playing with somebody else and they are going to play those chords, which we're going to cover what they are in this tuning for the main guitar, which is something that Jacob usually doesn't have to play, you can do that. You can just simply pause, move the capo so that you can continue to play the song in time. Now it's going to require you, if you are the singer, to be able to sing that melody as those chords are supposedly shifting underneath you. Because in order to move it, you kind of have to pause for a second. Or at least Jacob has to pause. I'm going to show you a way where you don't have to pause your guitar part and still be able to pull it off. So let's take a listen to what the guitar part sounds like going into that modulation the way Jacob has played it on the acoustic versions. This is also knowing that the melody that goes over the modulation is usually sung by Lizzie or Alita on those versions. So he's not even having to sing that part or play the chords as it's modulating. But pay attention to what I do play and what I don't play in order to move that capo for that part. And I know so much I want to say to you Even though I know Nothing's gonna change But I'll always find my way back here to you So he lands on that A over E for a second Then sp stops playing altogether Moves the capo up a whole fret So that he's ready for the downbeat on that new D shape, but it's raised a half step now. And now why do we have to do that? Why didn't he just modulate with some different chords? Well, because of the way he uses these top pedal notes or the droning strings, they're not going to work if we leave the capo here and simply modulate up and fret the chord that we want. We have dissonance. Wow, oh, dissonance is a good thing. Not in this case. So he needs to do that because we're relying on those droning strings to work over the progression because what happens after that modulation? He goes right back to the chord progression that we use throughout the entire verse and chorus, just like we did at the very beginning. So he makes that modulation. And then we're back to that progression again. 
same shapes, everything shifted a half step up. So now let's take a look at the way he has been playing it solo on electric guitar at the prism and on the zoom call that I've seen so far. And we're going to probably get more options as we see him play this more frequently once he gets on tour. So essentially what is happening in this modulation is there's, there's two chords. We're still considering this a D shape. The two chords that lead us into the new modulation to get to this capo moved up a half step is the five chord or the five seven chord in the key of D, again, in terms of the guitar and the capo position. So our five chord above D would be an A chord, a major chord. To make it the seven, this is where I lied to you a little bit at the beginning, and I'll admit it. There's four basic shapes that get us this far through the song. Now, this is where we don't have to learn a new chord shape. And so then I didn't really lie. If you want to play it the way Jacob does on the acoustic versions. But the way he's doing it solo, and for us to be able to play this as a solo artist, is we need to be able to play this modulation. And there are, there are two back-to-back -back seven chords. So the first one is a7. That shape looks like this. Up on this 7th fret. Again, we're going to break that pinky rule of the pinky not being on the 4th string because we have to use it here in order to get the reach. So here we have our root or our A. That one's our 7th up on the 10th fret. That would be our G. And on the 9th fret is our 3rd of our A chord, the C sharp. And we're modulating up a half step. So essentially what's happening is we're taking the 5-7 of this key that we're in and we're sliding it up a half step to be the new 5-7 of the key that we're going to. And once we get there, the capo has to be moved to now land in that new key. Now the two times I've seen Jacob play this without somebody else accompanying him, he plays this chord, slides it up, and then he has to move the capo after he lands on this chord and he doesn't have much time to do it. But it's possible. This voicing of this chord this high up on the neck is really hard to play and slide. If you're, especially if you're using your pinky. And he may be using these other two fingers so that his finger's a little bit stronger. But to be able to slide those chords and move the capo with not much time, I've noticed that he tends to struggle with it. And there's usually kind of a awkward pause because it's just too much to do at once, mechanically speaking. This is where the tools that you use can make some things easier. On both of those versions where he had to move the capo and he had to pause and it was a little bit of a struggle. I think he's using a capo, it might be a Daddario capo, where the grip this part where in order to squeeze it and move it is behind the neck. A Kaiser capo comes out in front of the guitar and I have found that they are much easier to move quickly than one that grips, especially there's some that grip but way behind the neck or like a G7 capo that clamps or a shove capo that clamps where you can't just move it. So here you need a quick change capo, one that has a spring that you can squeeze and move. I found that the Kaiser one is the easiest one to grab, especially in a situation like this. So let's see what it sounds like and see if we can do it on time. And I know, I know, nothing's gonna change. And I'll always find my way back here to you. There's a lot going on there. You're modulating vocally, which Jacob doesn't have to do because then it's a different singer. You're playing two chords using your pinky that are pretty stretched out, having to slide them and move a capo. You get why it's a problem? So, is there a way to make it easier? Yes, there is. I'm hoping this can help you, maybe even Jacob too. Okay, so if I said that we are sliding from the 5-7 of the key that we're in to the half step up to the 5-7 of the new key we're going to land in, 
We're still going to stay true to the harmonization, but we're going to do an inversion for a couple of reasons. So the notes that we're actually playing up here of the A chord are the A, G, and C sharp. It's the root, the seventh, and the third of that 5-7 chord. And we're sliding it up a half step. So what we don't have in that chord is the fifth of the chord. The fifth of the A chord would be an E. But we're only playing chords on three strings, so we're eliminating one. So the notes of the seven chord would be A as the root, C sharp as the third, E as the fifth, and G as the seventh. And again, I'm calling these names based on the shape that we're using above the capo, not the actual pitch. It's all just in reference to the capo position. On the transcription, I have introduced a new chord or a new chord shape that we can use that uses the same notes from the same chord. And it's built down here on the second fret where it's not as hard to reach, not as hard to slide with your finger spread out so much. It sounds like this. Now this is that diminished shape that we used in first inversion when we used it passing out of the instrumental section into the bridge, but built on the second fret. So the notes that we have in this inversion are E, the fifth of our A chord, C sharp, the third of our A chord, and G, the seventh of our A chord. Now we don't have the root, we don't have the A. But when we break down a dominant chord, we have our major third, A to C sharp, then we have a minor third from C sharp to E to our fifth, and then E to G is another minor third. Those top three notes, if you just take those top three notes, which is what we are doing here, that is a diminished triad, two stacked minor thirds. So we are taking the diminished top half of the 5-7 chord and just playing that now why? Why take out the root? Why do it here? Given that we need to move this capo and we'd like to do it smoothly, having the chord built down here gives us similar voicings that we've done throughout the whole song. We're still sticking true to the chords being built on only three strings. But now in order to move a capo and stay in time, there's a mechanical thing that we need to do to make it possible. The two chords themselves back to back would sound like this. So it's an easier shape to hold, kind of more power chordy, and not so spread out as it was up here and using our pinky, which is hard to slide. We can slide that chord. So the real trick is in leverage. In order to slide a chord, and instead of sliding the chord and then moving the capo, we're gonna do it simultaneously. I'm gonna do it slowly and then we're gonna break it down. where I slide both the capo and the chord at the same time. I know it's a lot, but what really helps make this work, as I mentioned, is leverage. In order to slide this chord, I have to be able to put force on the back side of the guitar in order to slide against it. Otherwise, the whole guitar is going to move. But if I've also got to do this and my arm is not touching the guitar, everything is going to shift. So the trick is, we play our first chord, when we go to reach for the capo, you rest your bicep kind of in this part of the guitar to hold the guitar against your body. And by doing that, I can keep the guitar stable, slide the chord and the capo at the same time. And again, the Kaiser capo reaches in front so it's easier for me to reach. I don't have to reach behind the neck of the guitar. And I've seen Jacob use a Kaiser before, so I know he's got one. And I think for this song, he should use it. So this is obviously going to take some practice beyond learning new chord shapes. This is kind of an awkward thing to have to do. However, it's totally doable. So I'm gonna cycle through just so you can see and hear it. This is the most mechanically difficult part of the song to play. 
However, once you're used to it, I think it's easier to play than the second pre-chorus of Little Blue with all the new chords and having to avoid the top strings, things like that. This is a mechanical hurdle to jump over and then you're back to using the simple shapes that we did at the very beginning of the song for the rest of the song. Okay, so is it really possible to do all of that even though Jacob doesn't have to do it? Let's see. And I know so much I want to say Even though I know nothing's gonna change But I'll always find my way back here to you Take me back to the window, take me back to the door You'll be right where I left you, sitting on the floor Alright, so take your pick Do what Jacob does in the acoustic ones Pause, move it carry on. You can try these other variations. If you really want the root of that 5-7 chord, it's on the third fret of your third string, which is the string that Jacob doesn't have, so go 2-4-3-3. Three, three. You know, just in case you want to make it even harder to play. So after we make that modulation, he goes right into a chorus, which is the same progression that we've used on the prior chorus, just everything is shifted a half step up. Take me back to the window, take me back to the door. You'll be right where I left you. Now when he gets to the line, sitting on the floor, he does those inversions, those major chord and second inversion again. Sitting on the floor. I'm never gonna be alone. Then he goes back to that B minor shape. Now I'm never gonna be alone. To the A over C sharp shape. And everything's up a half step, but the shape is what we're calling it by. Then he goes back into the progression for the tag. There's a patch of sunlight in my room. The garden where I held you for a moment. Back up to the F sharp minor shape. Finger picked a little outro. And there we have the whole song. Now a reminder, there is a transcription with all these variations written down in order for you to follow right along with. Visit that link that's in the description below. Also, please like and subscribe if you've enjoyed this video and you want to stay notified about other tutorials that I'll be making on Jacob's songs, be sure to click that bell notification. Now I really love the origin story behind this song. It was written during the pandemic, all virtually with Lizzie. Jacob had the progression of the chorus. and the lyrics for the chorus. And he sent it to Lizzie and she asked for uh, just a loop of the guitar part. And she wrote the verses over the top of that. And lyrically, he talked about how this song kind of, he wanted to explore the deep, vivid, emotional world of isolation, loss, and memory. Um, blurring the lines between reality and imagination. That's kind of a quote from him. After he and Lizzie had the verse and choruses put together, they were joking around about, oh, wouldn't it be cool if John Mayer played the solo on this? And they made a recording of themselves. Uh, I don't remember if Jacob was either playing on piano or, or singing a, a, what could be a solo and laughing about it. And they sent that video to John and he said he'd do it. So there we have that final version. Now, if you're interested in extra exclusive content, come join me over on Patreon where I'm building a community of people who are interested in these tutorials, and we're gonna have an opportunity to go a little deeper, and I'll be sharing more information with you over there that I don't share here on YouTube. Let me know in the comments what other songs of Jacob's you'd be most interested in, and they'll be coming up soon. Thanks for watching.